Ace, you have the floor. Thank you indeed, uh, President Galtieri, and for facilitating this opportunity uh, for us to put these questions. Uh, President Draghi, uh, you're welcome once again to ECON. Um, and I recognise that the, uh, the Irish bailout did not happen on your watch as President of the ECB. You have repeatedly said, President, that the ECB is accountable to European citizens uh, through this Assembly, and I welcome that accountability. So in the context of that accountability, there are some unanswered questions that remain that many Irish citizens want asked of you and the ECB uh, in the context of the, the Irish bailout. I have three questions uh, to ask you, President Draghi. Firstly, why did the ECB on two separate occasions demand that Ireland pay unsecured and unguaranteed creditors of two banks, namely Anglo-Irish Bank and Irish Nationwide, uh, banks that were clearly insolvent? Uh, we are not talking here about public debt, we are not talking about sovereign debt, which is the absolute responsibility of Ireland. We are talking about private debt and we are talking about private banks that had losses of eight times uh, their capital. And do you accept that the refusal of the ECB to allow Ireland to write down unsecured debt in these two zombie banks uh, put uh, unfair and unprecedented pressure on Irish taxpayers? Now, your predecessor claimed that there was a consensus on this decision, a consensus that did not include Ireland. And why was Ireland overruled by the ECB in relation uh, to this matter? My second question relates to the emergency liquidity assistance. And could you explain to the committee why did the ECB allow uh, that emergency li liquidity assistance to be 25% before the crisis? And finally, uh, you're the current president of the ECB. Could you ever envisage a circumstance, President Draghi, where you would write to a Eurozone finance minister and tell that finance minister by way of correspondence that unless they uh, signed up to a programme that they would then find that you emergency should, should liquidity was cut off. I'm sorry. I, I didn't understand the last part of your last question. Uh, it, uh, my, my, my last question is, could you ever envisage a circumstance where you would write to a Eurozone finance minister and say that you would cut off ELA unless they signed up to a programme? It's a hypothetical question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Emmy, uh, it, it's, a, it's a set of um, uh, quite rich questions to answer. But first of all, uh, let me make one general point, which I'll make on other questions, in answering other questions on Ireland. Uh, let's not forget that the whole banking crisis was entirely homemade. Let's start from this point. Um, and it was exacerbated by a series of actions that were taken by the government at that time before the ECB had been involved into this. I'll come back on this in a moment. The second point is more of a, I would say, formal point, but it's nonetheless important. Namely, the burning out of senior bondholders was not a decision taken by the ECB. It was taken by the Irish government. The ECB advised in that direction, certainly, but the ECB didn't have the authority or the means to impose this decision. Third point, we've been talking a lot about this bailout, but we forget that before the bailout, private investors in Ireland had already suffered losses which overall between write-offs of uh, equity and junior uh, write-offs of uh, subordinated debt amount to something like 43 billion euros. The bailout we talk about is in the first in instance was at most 4 billion and in the second instance was only 2 billion. So let's just, I'm saying this just to have a, an idea of the relative proportion of the figures. Second or uh, fourth point, we, I, and, and I made this point in various different contexts, it's very difficult to judge 
the actions that were decided at that time, in previous times, this holds for Ireland but also holds for other program countries with the eyes of today. At that time, there were no clear rules about bail-in. And there were no precedents. So there was no idea what uh, uh, the order of precedents should, uh, should be in, in these cases. Now this implied that uh, uh, the situation on financial markets uh, was, well this contributed actually to making the situation on financial markets which was al already very fragile for a variety of reasons, even more so because of this uncertainty about the order of precedents. And this had resulted in, a, in an exasperated volatility. Our advice against uh, burden sharing was not a matter of principle. As a matter of fact, the ECB is in favor of burden sharing now. But the necessary precedents and the conditions to facilitate the bailing of senior creditors were just missing at that point in time. Then we had some positive developments. In 2011, at the end of the first quarter, we had the outcome of the so-called PCAR, Prudential Capital Assessment Review of the Irish banks. And uh, you may remember that some of the institutions were foreseeing a much higher capital need. But according to the ECB staff estimate, the final figure was actually lower. And this uh, certainly contributed to restoring confidence in the markets. At that point, when the confidence was just returning, the ECB was of the view that it would, be, it would have been highly disruptive to have a bail-in of, as I said, at most four billion after the 43, 44 billion had already been bailed in before. So it would have been highly disruptive. In other words, the costs would not offset the benefits of this bail-in. This was the view. And uh, later on in 2011, this view was confirmed. And it was just the bail-in at that point in time was only $2 billion. The foreseeable bail-in was about $2 billion also because the Irish authorities wanted to exempt from the bail-in two Irish banks. So it was, uh, it was a small bail-in to begin with, with a potential high cost in terms of confidence in, uh, in, the, Irish, uh, in the Irish program. Uh, you also, one also should remember that the issue at stake there was restoring market access, which, by the way, is the key issue in all programs, really. And so the main objective at that time was, uh, was to achieve market access, and this was thanks to the compliance with the program, thanks to the action of the Irish government, thanks to the sacrifices of the Irish people, this was achieved, and it was the beginning of a story which is... 100% a success story of which all the Irish people should be proud of. Uh, turning to the question about ELA, I, um, I would point out the written reply I gave to European Parliament member Matt Carthy in February where we explained the decision-making process to grant ELA. Again, a formal point, but nonetheless important, which I make all the times, not only in the case of Ireland, the responsibility for the provision of ELA lies with the respective national central bank. In this case, the Central Bank of Ireland, and not with the ECB. And the same goes with the solvency assessment that is the basis for the known objection of the Governing Council to the request of the National Central Bank. In other words, the National Central Bank proposes the ELA. The ELA can be given only to banks that are solvent and have adequate or good sufficient collateral. The quality of this collateral is assessed by the competent supervisor, which at that time was the Central Bank of Ireland. 
And that is crucial because if the, if the supervisor says the collateral is adequate, is good, is sufficient, then the governing council have no reasons to object to the request of the National Central Bank. So having said that, uh, one should also remember that um, the governing council expressed several times concern about the volumes of ELA that were, that were uh, given by the National Central Bank at that time. Now, uh, let me just uh, conclude this long answer. Uh, fortunately, now the situation is entirely different. As I said, not only uh, Ireland has come out of the program with the flying colors, it's now the fastest growing country in the European Monetary Union. The per capita GDP of Ireland is higher, way higher than the national, than the European, than the euro area average. But also the overall situation is different. We now have clear rules for, for bank recovery and resolution. We have a well-defined order of precedence for our creditors, uh, for bank creditors. We have a one supervisor now, so we don't have, we have almost completely eliminated this ambiguity of who does what. So, all in all, a lot of progress has been achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Bert